today. And joining me on the broadcast is Ambassador Vivek Kaju, former Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs. Also with me on the broadcast, Sushant Sareen, Senior Fellow at the Observer Research Foundation and Sanjay Jha, Political Analyst. Sushant Sareen, Dr. Jay Shankar has taken the battle right into the Congress camp on the issue of the United Nations Security Council seat. The EM saying that the, this charge is extremely serious. The fact that the EAM says that China's interests should come first is very peculiar, accusing Nehru of putting China first. Yeah, so some of it, uh, Gaurav, uh, is, uh, is, you know, a kind of a political statement. But I think on the larger point, where uh, Pandit Nehru's own letters say that, you know, we have to first, we are okay, even if we are going to get a seat to the United States, Nation Security Council, but first China must be accommodated out there, to something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing. Clearly, I think Dr. Jayashankar hits the nail on the head when he says that, look, how can the prime minister of a country uh, put the interests of another country before his own country? Now, at best, this is romanticism. At worst, this is naivety. I certainly won't accuse Nehru of uh, being disloyal to this country. That is certainly not my case. But yeah, there was this thing that, you know, you want to appear to be very nice to some countries like China and some of the other countries. We've done the same thing with Pakistan. We've done the same thing with many other countries where we say, no, no, you have to first take care of their interests. You know, in the real world, you have to put your country's interest uppermost above everything else. OK. Uh, and, you know, all this virtue signaling, which was done in the past simply so that you uh, appear to be nice to uh, countries like China hasn't really paid off. How did it pay off? And one second, Gaurav, it's extremely important to understand that uh, Pandit Nehru was nobody's fool. At the time when he was saying all this, he was also mindful of what the Chinese were up to. Yes. And he knew what the Chinese ingress into India is. He knew all of that. Now, I don't know whether this was part of his diplomatic thing that, you know, you, you uh, don't grab that seat from China and then China will become more reasonable. I don't know if it was about that. But the fact remains but a that degree he knew of what China was up to and yet he put China's interest over India. Putting China's interest over India. Sanjay Jha, this charge was leveled by Arun Jaitley when he called Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru the original sinner, quoting what, uh, what at that time was described as Nehru's August 2nd, 1955 letter to chief ministers. Dr. Jay Shankar says it's a major change, the China policy followed by the Narendra Modi government compared to the policy that was followed earlier, Sanjay Jha. Uh, Gaurav, let me make two short points. Number one, this is not a book written by a diplomat. This is a politician following the playbook of the BJP. I read, or rather, I even saw some of the snippets of his interview given to ANI. He talks, the book itself is called Why Bharat Matters. And Mr. Jayashankar has the audacity to say that India's mindset and spirit and self-confidence and identity has emerged after 2014. I think it is an insult to India's politicians, technocrats, businessmen, farmers, laborers, students, you know, the startups, and to media, to everybody to believe that India has only developed a certain steely confidence after 2014. I would like to very, you know, with due respects to Mr. Jashankar say, he needs to know his own political history. But the second point on Mr. Nehru is critical. And this is why I believe this is a brazen election campaign effort done by Mr. Jashankar. And I will debunk his lie on your program. This is, uh, God of you have been a friend, and I think you're a very responsible anchor. Let me quote to you what Pandit Nehru said on the floor of the House in Parliament on 27th of September, 1955, to a question asked to him on the whole question of is in, has India got an offer from the United States on becoming a member of the permanent member of the UN Security Council. These are the words of Pandit Nehru as the prime minister of the country. The prime minister said there has been no offer formal or informal of this kind. Some vague references have appeared in the press about it, which have no foundation in fact. The composition of the Security Council is prescribed by the Charter of the United Nations. And according to that, only a decision can be taken. So the question of India accepting or rejecting such okay. a decision was out of the question. And here is the second point. 
who is the united states or russia to make an offer to the to, to india i mean any decision would have to be made by the un charter itself amending its own constitution Fair so enough. i mean this is basically an exaggeration played out by the right wing and i think it needs to be debunked publicly let me get a, ambassador kadju to tragic, weigh in on this ambassador kadju ambassador kadju dr jay shankar has been quoted as saying when it came to the unsc seat to say china should get it first china's interest should come first is a very peculiar statement to make what do you make of it because this charge was also leveled by late arun jetli and if i may uh, he says pandit jawaharlal nehru's infamous letter to chief ministers dated august 2 1955 states informally suggestions have been made by the united states that china should be taken into the united nations but not in the security council and that india should take her place in the security council we cannot of course accept this as it means falling out with china it would be very unfair for a great country like china not to be in the security council unquote ambassador kadju well uh, i have great respect for my old colleague jay shankar i think uh, he was an excellent diplomat he, and uh, his foreign secretaryship was richly deserved and he is now the external affairs minister Uh, his knowledge of these things is far more than mine but if i recollect correctly i think the chinese were permanent members of the security council right from the beginning china it so happened that it was not uh, beijing after 9, 1949 after the communist takeover it was really taiwan which was uh, the member uh, therefore the americans to my mind when i read all this this is not new true sure. jay shankar has said is 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 old stuff but when i read this the first thought that struck me was that the americans had dangled a carrot let us see let us not forget that this is 1955 the height of the cold war uh, the rush the soviets were quoting us so were the americans and we were pursuing a policy of non alignment also recollect that in 1954 the americans had aligned themselves with the pakistanis the pakistanis had become alliance partners yes. of of america therefore there was a full context here and i i for one uh, cannot imagine that the russians would have exceeded if you recollect the the russian soviet uh, uh, sorry the soviet chinese problem began later it hadn't surfaced in 1955 so i can't imagine that the soviets would have uh, acquiesced in throwing out the chinese and putting in india as a member of the security council so uh, jay shankar uh, is saying the, uh, uh, is making a statement which i for one find difficult to accept now that doesn't mean that nehru didn't make mistakes in his china policy of course he did but i can also think that there was i mean if you are saying of romanticism mm -hmm. in an approach to china then let me ask and ask with great humility was there not a little romanticism in the early years of the modi regime the modi government with regard to china wasn't there an attempt at personal diplomacy between which prime minister modi uh, embarked on and which was endorsed by jay shankar he should read his remarks to the shanghai uh, shanghai uh, sorry uh, to the singapore uh, security dialogue of 2015 and when he is loading the role of personal chemistry in international affairs which he does so even in this, the, in this book which he does even in this book uh, no, no, uh, you know when he's talking about uh, chemistry and credibility both uh, uh, very extensively but, but the point uh, remains but, is but, there a but, shift but, to uh, realism one second one second go on ambassador kadhi has that has that worked we've tried realism um, in we have even gone to the prime minister and rightly 
has said atmanirbhar bharat manufacturing must increase import from china must decrease after that call have import from china decreased these are hard questions that have to be asked yep. we have to ask ourselves these questions shan sarin wants to come in so shan sarin wants to come in yeah. ambassador kadju imports from china one aspect but india is not letting china walk all over us or are we when you put 50000 troops on the on on the line of actual no, no, control and no, no, do not I permit chinese there. i have a point there Go the on. chinese the chinese want this because the chinese can outspend us we of course we are doing the right thing by putting troops the chinese can't walk over us they can't be allowed signed 1962 was a disaster we can never forget that and today india of 2024 is a different india and the chinese know that okay but the fact is that the lac today is costing us far more and the chinese economy is six times ours we can't follow the path of pakistan who have ruined themselves by uh, by trying to meet us uh, on a confrontational basis now which doesn't mean that we become defensive with china i think our chinese policy today is correct but the point is that when you evaluate these things okay. then you can evaluate them strategically Fair or enough. you can evaluate Sushant them Sarin wanted to come in Sushant Sarin you wanted to come in on the aspect of imports from china remaining extremely high at a time when the effort is to bring in more realism in the relationship Gaurav I am not getting your audio very clearly so I can't really hear I have missed the last part of Mr Karju's thing but if you allow me to come on the earlier part of mr karju what he was saying okay you know again uh, to call mr modi's initial interactions with the chinese president romanticism i think mr karju is being a little disingenuous out here you know in diplomacy and he is a seasoned diplomat in diplomacy you certainly meet people you certainly put your best foot forward but if you remember very clearly even at the time that xi jinping had come to india uh, there was an incident which was taking place along eastern ladakh yes. right and what was the indian reaction and what was the tone and tenor in which uh, the indian side responded and this was a government which was i think maybe just about a month into office maybe a little more i don't remember the exact date so the point is that you put your best foot forward but you also dug in your heels where you needed to number one number two yes as a part of diplomacy you continue to engage with the chinese but you didn't give in on anything to them uh, and to say that the chinese want you to put your troops along the border because then they will outspend you then let's not put any troops along the border then everybody can out what are you so talking I, about no, one That's second sir please I let mean. me complete because i can't hear uh, what is being said so let me just have my say so i i i don't i don't agree with that and finally on this whole question of imports raul uh, sorry gorav uh, on this whole question of imports the bottom line is that you know ask anybody on critical infrastructure our imports have more or less stopped from china on a range of other things we are asking companies to start manufacturing in india this is not something this is not a light switch which will happen you switch on a light and suddenly all the production will happen in india and you don't need china after that in fact even after you become atmanirbhar you will continue to deal with china at an economic level because after all it's with the second largest economy in the world you can't completely ignore them yes. the americans have not been able to do it so to expect us that we'll be able to do it overnight simply because the prime minister has rooted in favor of atmanirbhar bharat which is exactly what we should be doing i think that's rather unfair and finally on all this whole uh, you know this this nehru controversy see the bottom line is that whatever the international context and we can have arguments on that but i think the primary thing is that when pandit nehru writes to the chief ministers and he says that china is this great country and china must be there it's only after that we will come in the point is that you are putting in china's interest first in a written letter to indian chief ministers and the fact was that while taiwan had been given china's seat this is an informal kind of a sounding out okay. of that you bring in india rather than china that china is not interested so you keep china out and you bring india in we should have played with it why didn't we play with it 
We should have seen how far it goes. We should have seen where the Soviets stand. We should have seen where the Chinese stand. Uh, sure. uh, sorry, where the Americans stand and where the Brits and the French will stand. So we but should have put Indian national interest first. Pandit Nehru was this great guy. I think, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that form of diplomacy. Fair enough. Uh, Ambassador Kaju wants to come in as the Sanjay Jha. But Ambassador Kaju, you want to quickly respond to Sushant Sareen um, on the letter to the Chief Minister, especially that aspect. Why not put Indian interest first? Look, I can't imagine any Indian Prime Minister who has not put Indian interest first. Starting from Prime Minister Nehru. Okay, give me a moment as I try Prime and establish. Prime Minister Modi is a patriot. He has, put, uh, he, he has put Indian interest first. And so I believe that Pandit Nehru put Indian interest first. Now, we can disagree. We can disagree with certain phraseology that he had used. We can disagree with his, his approach to China uh, in the context of 62. But the point is that his reading, I believe, in 1955 was... Okay, give me a moment as we try and reestablish that link with you, sir. Uh, you know, the loss of Aksai Chin, Panchil, Hindi Chini, Bye Bye, the run-up to 62, the defeat in 1962, uh, where ill-prepared uh, Ill soldiers were pushed at the line of actual control uh, or, or the borders to face uh, China, uh, the statement about Assam and my heart goes out to Assam. What does all of that indicate... Does it indicate a certain degree of romanticism far removed from realism? But Sanjay Jha, this isn't restricted just to China. Even on Pakistan, Dr. Jay Shankar says that Pakistan's policy of using terror as a means to get India to the talks table is no longer working. That's off the table. Sanjay Jha on Pakistan. Gaurav, I can tell you that Mr. Jay Shankar has failed as a foreign minister of India. And I repeat it again, because I know he's got these cult followers. I will give you two evidence of that. Number one, look at India's neighborhood policy. You are today literally surrounded by states which have become friendlier towards China. Maldives has openly pivoted, officially pivoted towards China. We know the investments in Sri Lanka are resulting in a political asymmetrical imbalance. You look at Bhutan and Nepal, they are all actually now, you know, kind of pussyfooting with China very openly. And of course, I think these are all significant messages of the kind of risks we are exposing ourselves to. Not to forget, obviously, about the risks of a two front war with the Pakistan China axis. How can Mr. Jay Shankar use hyperbole to dodge this reality? Point number two. You know, he talks about India's prestige, etc. Let me tell you, I think Mr. Jashankar should read the foreign media that he clearly has contempt for, because that is an equal determinant of your global reputation. And the truth is that on democracy, on sectarianism, on the death of India's institutions, India is taking an extremely nasty hit all over the world. Obviously, you're a big economy. Foreign powers will quote you. Everyone wants to go to a big consumer market and a cheap labor market. But that has nothing to do with Modi. Anyone who becomes a prime minister in 2024 will reap the harvest of a country which has a certain threshold of a GDP okay. size. And the last point before I, before I conclude, you know, I think Smita Prakash asked him a question on the issue of all these, you know, the issues in Canada and, and the recent uh, U.S. government inquiry into the attempt to murder a, a Sikh separatist. And Mr. Jay Shankar, like his guru, Mr. Modi, actually told her, no questions, please. This is not a press conference. So no, I but think he did, did answer the question on, on, no, no, that, he did answer the question on, on uh, Canada, where he said, give us evidence, we'll look at it. Yeah, but he, you know, he I, did I, respond. I the way he's, no, Gaurav, I think he stonewalled that conversation. I thought Smita Prakash did, did ask him to sure. kind of elaborate because the Indian government has said, we will inquire into whatever are the allegations made no, but why, why would we think that the Western media, I'm sorry, I disagree with you, uh, you know, res very respectfully, Sanjay Jha, on why, why should we accept what the Western media may write as the gospel? Uh, you know, you're an Indian citizen, you, you know what's happening in our country, you don't want Western validation, do you? But let yeah. me get Sushant Sareen, Gaurav. let me get Sushant Gaurav. Sareen to no, respond Gaurav, to that. No, one because point. there is such just uninformed commentary that's no, happening in, in a section of the Western media, I'm surprised we should, we should uh, you know, uh, even consider uh, what the Western media writes, especially when there are some articles that write that Russia is India's new best friend.
Really? New best friend? But Sushant Sarin, you wanted to come in both on the aspect of Pakistan and Canada. Yeah, but uh, Gaurav, uh, you know, on the Western media, not only do uh, people like Mr. Jha look for validation from the Western media, they actually look for intervention from the West to try and make India a more democratic country from the United States where a, a prime uh, a presidential candidate is being debarred and not being allowed to contest from countries in Europe which are electing uh, leaders which Mr. Jha would certainly not countenance and yet it's democracy in India that is affected and which is why these guys are going all over the world trying to lobby for support so that India yeah. is bad-mouthed, India is this and these guys think that that will get them votes in Bhagalpur and Bhivandi and all kinds of other places in this country. Good luck to them. On the issue of uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, Gaurav, uh, I think what the Prime Minister, uh, what the Foreign Minister said was correct. But I think even on Pakistan, that realism in India's policy came after the Uri attacks and the yes, first surgical strikes. Yes. We took it up one notch after uh, the, the uh, uh, Pulwama attacks. And now it has become a policy. But I don't think the Pakistanis have changed their policy of using terrorism to try and bring India onto the table. And you yes. will see that in recent statements, including of Shabash Sharif, who's probably, whose lexicon is a little challenged, so he thinks what is happening in Kashmir is a genocide. He probably never saw the pictures of Lal Chonk on the 31st December night, uh, because in Lahore and everywhere else, their puppet prime minister had banned all kinds of celebration. So Shabash Sharif is clearly challenged, and he's trying to suck up to the army, like the other politicians. The army itself has come out with statements which are obnoxious, uh, to say the least. Uh, and you have the Pakistani Foreign Office make its you know, typical vituperative comments on India. Okay. So I don't think the Pakistani policy well, on point. India has changed. But I suspect that you know, maybe Mr. Jay Shankar might just have left a little opening for the Pakistanis that in case they want to you know, re-engage with India at a political level, we are ready to do it. But he also made it very clear that we haven't completely broken off engagement, which we cannot because simply because, you know, you're neighboring countries. So you have to do some business of state with each other. But and beyond that, Pakistan, I don't think this relationship with Pakistan is going to go anywhere. You know, if Pakistan engages with us after 370, well, uh, you know, uh, it, it's good. It's good. Uh, they've accepted the reality of 370. But Ambassador Kaju, you've dealt with Pakistan all through your career, sir, first time I met you, you were JS Pai. Um, do you notice a change in the policy that was followed earlier? Okay, I still do not have that link with uh, Ambassador Kaju. Sushant Sarin, quickly, uh, sorry, uh, Sanjay Jai, you wanted to come in, sir. Yeah, I wanted to make this point here that, you know, it is very easy for Sushant Sarin to say, you know, just kind of trash the Western media. But this is the same foreign minister. This is the same Mr. Modi who are actually very happy to become the bulwark for United States to contain China as part of their policy here, which are very happy to attract FDI investment, which are very happy to say that this is what Biden said about Trump, Biden okay. and Trump said about Modi. But hang on, when the New York Times or the Western media says that Indian democracy or Indian communalism is raging, then you say, well, you know, kindly ignore them. What sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. That hypocrisy doesn't work. And I think Mr. Jay Shankar had to defend Abki Bar Trump Sarkar, which I thought was the most embarrassing diplomatic gap in India's diplomatic history. Okay, if I were to come back to the Pakistan policy, post Pulwama Ambassador Kaju, do you notice do you notice a change? You, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar says Pakistan's policy of using terror as a means to get India to the talks table isn't working. No, I think the Pakistan policy after Balakot has been the correct policy. And I believe that the Modi government has, has done the right thing in this. But uh, let us not also overlook the fact that it took some time to reach this position. So as always, there is continuity and change in policies. And today, I welcome the foreign pol the policy that is being pursued with Pakistan. Uh, it took some time in coming to this position. It took the tragedy of Pulwama to yes. come to this position. But now that it has reached this and the fact that they've pursued it for five years is right. All okay. the time we were saying terror and talks can't go together. And 
since nine uh, since 2019 uh, we've pursued this policy and i only hope we will continue to pursue this policy because uh, this is something that we i believe in and i personally was advocating it from the oh absolutely i remember reporting on it right uh, since since the mid 1990s uh, when you were js spy the terror and talks uh, do not go simultaneously and i will let that be the last word on the show ambassador kaju sanjay jha and sushant sarin for joining me on this uh, india today special many thanks